Paper and Glam readers, welcome to the August edition of the Paper and Glam Book Club. Tonight we are discussing a book that is inspired by one of my favorite authors and a very, very celebrated author in the Paper and Glam community, Ellen Montgomery. If you don't know Ellen Montgomery, she wrote a little book called Anne of Green Gables, plus many, many other books, and she is prolific or was prolific and has kind of a reputation for being the seasonal queen. She has the most beautiful seasonal descriptions in her books. And this book, Maud by Melanie Fishbane, is a book that really was inspired by her life. So it's a fictionalized version of her life based on everything we know about Ellen Montgomery from her, her journals. So with that, we're going to do a little housekeeping before we get started and do an icebreaker, give everyone a chance to settle in. I'm really excited to be back in full effect this month that I am finally out of my reading slump. I have, I kind of read like I breathe. I read all throughout the day usually, but Man, it's been a year, amen. So I did not read really at all May, June, and July, but I'm back this month, just like back in my reading game, and it just feels amazing to like have taken a beautiful picture of the book to share with you guys and to write the questions and shout out to librarian Anna who's on with me for holding down the book club for it. I could not have done it without her this summer. So um, our book chatters are having a bit of a reading slump themselves this month. So it's just Anna and I, which means we have an opening for new book chatters. So if you would like to join us live, I would love that. We clearly need some more people to join us to discuss our amazing selections. So email bookclub at paperandglam.com if you would like to be a book chatter. We film the Wednesday before book club at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time, and that's every single month. So with that, uh, Let's get into the icebreaker, which amazing librarian Anna wrote. Do you annotate your books or otherwise track your reading? If so, how? If not, any reason why? So um, I guess I'll go first unless you want to take it away, Anna. I know we both have quite the uh, reading tracking <laughs> uh, life to discuss. So I love this question, Anna. And of course, it's inspired by the book. We always try to do an icebreaker inspired by the book because um, Ella Montgomery annotates her books and Maud in the book and Maud in real life also annotated her books. So she was talking about uh, reading a book with Nate um, who inspired Gilbert Blythe, if you are an Anne of Green Gables fan. And she talks about on page 39, and I just love this, Maud loved how the paper caressed her fingers, the curve of the spine, and the musty smell of a well-read and well-loved book. There was also something delicious in sharing a book with Nate. She was enjoying the little breadcrumbs he left in the margins and noting the passages he underlined. It was as if they were having a secret conversation. So I think that's so beautiful. And oh, that was just so incredibly romantic. Just the idea of sharing a book with someone. I don't know if you guys have ever shared a book with someone, but it is a really intimate experience. And I love that. I love that she called that out and that she was in the book, she was reluctant to give Nate her copy of Little Women because it was like so much of it she had highlighted. And then I also loved what she also said about annotating books a little bit further down. And then on page 134 and 135, she talks about rereading Little Women and how she marks different things on the second go round. And I do that too. So when I reread a book, I always highlight in pink highlighter, but if I go back and read a book again, I'll highlight in a different color and I always highlight different things and different things stick out to me. So I love what she said here. She underlined different sections this time, understanding Joe better now and her ambition. When Bond finished reading it, her heart still ached for Nate, but she felt more sure of her decision. She hoped someday he would forgive her. Things were always, weren't always as clear in life as they were in books, and sometimes not even then. She, but she would never forget the first boy who loved her, whom she had loved. So she talks about rereading Little Women after they had shared the book, which I thought was just, you know, Maud is a woman after my own heart. So I love that. Um, I don't really write too much in my books. I will if I have a thought, but I mainly just highlight. And then um, second part of the question, um, how I track my reading. So I have developed what I call the Type Awesome TBR, which is a 
the mother of all reading spreadsheets. And if you're a patron, you have seen me go through this in the July installment. You can watch that anytime. The template is also free to patrons and it has tabs for everything I want to read. And it's, it's like you can sort it by setting, you can sort it by publication date, author, season, month, anything. So if I'm like, oh, I really want to read like a Christmas book, I can sort by Christmas, which is amazing. And it has almost 900 titles on it. So um, if you wanted to use it and you're like, oh, I'm going to take a trip to San Francisco, you could sort by setting San Francisco and all the books that I recommend for San Francisco are on there. So I have been working on this spreadsheet for about four years. And so it has that TBR, it has everything I've read every year. So there's that plus like my ratings, when I read it, and then there's tabs for like themes, like if there's a bunch of books on certain themes, there's my all time favorite books. So I have a very elaborate TBR process. I, anytime I get books, I add them to the tab that's my library catalog so I can keep track of everything that's in my library. And the spreadsheet has just been uh, my great joy. And it's also um, shareable for you for patrons. So I'd love for you to join the patron experience and also join our live stream and all the good the good content we do just about the reading life in general. All right, Miss Anna, your spreadsheet is a wonder to behold and you shared it with us as well. And I have many follow-up questions. So tell our, our readership about your spreadsheet. All right, so I have, I keep track of all of my reading through Goodreads and in my Type Awesome Bookish Life spreadsheet, which is basically my version of the Type Awesome TBR that Lisa Marie was mentioning. Um, I track, super detailed ratings. Um, I don't really write a lot of notes about the books, um, but because I do tend to review them on my blog, I try to keep like a note of as like who is the act, who's the intended audience, but then who is it actually like appropriate for. Um, I keep track of what I thought about like the characters, the atmosphere, the plot. Um, and then I also just finished transferring everything from my want to read list on Goodreads into that spreadsheet, which took a really long time. Even after editing, I still ended up with over 700 titles on that list. Um, and yeah, everything's color coded, everything's sortable. And then now it's also allowing me to go through and actually clean up my Goodreads and be able to sort things a lot better on Goodreads. Cause I do know that people will, are more likely to go to Goodreads to check out, um, like what people shelved other titles as. And so I want to make it easier for people to find. And then also it's also useful when I'm at work because then I can just pull up Goodreads on my phone and be like, okay, so this is appropriate for this age. Um, and I have all my notes right there. Um, personally, I don't annotate my books mostly because I am super type, type awesome and that I change my color coding every other month. And so if I actually highlighted in my books, I would eventually like have no idea why I highlighted something if I went back to read it. Um, but I love the idea of it. Like one of my favorite things in special editions of books is when the authors actually do annotate a chapter and they have it as like a bonus edition. Um, and that's one of my favorite like special editions for books. But I personally just can't get into highlighting books. But if I do read a lot of eBooks nowadays, um, I have a Kindle Fire and it's my ride or die and being able to highlight in advanced reader copies or um, or just regular ebooks has been a lifesaver because then also I can save everything I highlighted all my notes into my Amazon account and then upload it to Goodreads as well. Um, and those can be private or public. So I still have those notes without having to like flip through the book and look for them. Forgot to unmute. I'm just gonna say I love it. And if you didn't know, Librarian Anna is not only the Paper and Glam librarian, she's also a real life librarian in Denver. So she's a bookish authority. And I just love that about our chatters who clearly I think everybody is like getting back to like back to school mode. So totally all grace. But I love that about our book chatting rosters that everyone has such a like specific reading life. We have like super readers and booksellers and literature professor and like just people from all walks of the bookish life and of course just like regular readers um also so all righty uh, how was your experience reading mod and how many red journals would you rate it so i rated it three i really struggle with 
um, character driven books usually. Um, I love nonfiction and I love like really plot driven fiction usually, but this one I struggled with, but it, it's hard for me to rate a book like this because it is such a historically accurate fictionalization of Ellen Montgomery's life. And there were so many references to just really specific things in, in her journals and also like kind of come, you could tell she, the author was really trying to like, uh, how do I say this? Trying to kind of pull, tie things together from Anne of Green Gables and, and a lot of those, the writings of Ellen Montgomery. So, um, yeah, just for like readability, I would say a three, but like if we're rating against like author intent, I think it was really beautifully ex executed and it felt so much like a book of, of Ella Montgomery's and it felt so true to who she was and what we know of her. And for reasons we're totally gonna get into, I'm a big, I'm a big Ella Montgomery fan. She was just like an iconic, iconoclast of her time and just such an incredible inspiration. How was your reading experience of, uh, of Maud Anna? I definitely agree with author intent. This was probably a four, maybe even a five. Um, I think that Melanie Fishbane did a fantastic job bringing to life the journals, um, especially going back into the author note and realizing that Maud was actually an editor of her own of her own journals, um, which I thought was really fascinating. Uh, for readability, I also gave it a solid three red journals. Um, I think it was well written, but the pacing was kind of kind of choppy in my opinion and while Maud the character um both the fictional parts and the real life parts were really well done I found the side characters like her grandparents her father um her stepmother and everyone just kind of seemed very two-dimensional and I don't know if it was on purpose or if it was just the author's writing style just trying to really highlight um Maud and also she's working from a limited, um, kind of a limited, uh, what's the word? Source material. There we go. Um, and so because of that, I think that just, they kind of just showed up to be a constant thorn in Maud's side throughout the book and we never really understood why. And so that drove me absolutely nuts. But other than that, I thought the book was really well done. Yeah, I totally agree. And I wondered about that too. And, you know, what inspired my love of Ellen Montgomery was when I was little, I used to love this Disney Channel show called Avonlea that was all based on novels, the, basically the Anne of Green Gables series. And Marilla it felt, you know, that it is a little bit of a 2D character in the beginning, especially. And I can kind of tell that she was inspired by her Maud's grandmother and I part of me wonders if in a lot of ways people were I don't want to say people were more two-dimensional because people have always been people but um you know the older generations had less of a spirit of individualism that we have today it was much more like you get up you work you go to bed and then you do it all again and there was there was much more of as like a sense of duty, in my opinion, and maybe you guys can kind of articulate what I mean better because, you know, of the lives of your grandparents. Um, but yeah, as, as, you know, my grandmother was, and my great grandmother, who I, who I knew, you know, was very much alive in this time, and like, we're going to talk about it, but, you know, women were almost 2D characters. It, it felt like in that time, um, I mean, again, women have always been women, but um, yeah, just like they weren't encouraged to kind of show their personality, which is such a big theme all throughout the book, the way that Maude is forced to kind of stifle her individuality. Just every page is some sort of episode where, you know, she's too emotional or she's, you know, not worried about her reputation enough or, you know, it, it's all kind of just like putting her in a box. And that was such a through line throughout the whole book. But we'll talk about that more um, throughout the rest of the questions. All right, number two, Maude is a fictionalized account of Ellen Montgomery's teenage years as she navigates the choice between her duty and her dreams. Told in three distinct parts based on her physical location, what do you think about this episodic structure that is reminiscent of Montgomery's novel titles? And how do you think the structure ties in with the themes of purpose, 
duty, and identity. So this is a doozy of a question that Anna wrote, which I just absolutely love. This completely went over my head. And I just have to say, since, you know, the summer when everything changed for me with, with COVID and, uh, and just becoming a one woman show and just really focusing on serving paper and glam customers. I have, I have been just, just, just love doing book clubs so much more because of Anna's companionship and just writing all these questions with her. And so, yeah. Um, thank you, Anna. I, I know I tell you all the time, but this is like a million times more fun now that we're doing this together. And if you are in the paper and glam community, any of our communities, whether that's seasonal living or Bible study or book club or planning, and you see a place where you would love to plug in and you can, you see a place where you could help me co-create this beautiful thing we call paper and glam. I would so love that. I'm open to your ideas and I can definitely use all the help I can get. And I'm so glad that the Anna volunteered her time because this is just so much more fun than writing all the questions on my own and with um some help from the preps for sure we have a little prep group but um man this this one was a doozy i don't even have an answer because this went totally over my head so i'm hoping you can school us anna all right it makes you feel any better this was a doozy of a question for myself as well um so i'm going to assume that uh, Melanie Fishbane did this on purpose because if you know uh Ella Montgomery's work you know that she does like she does Anne of Green Gable, Anne of Avonlea. Um, I think she actually has one that's called Anne of the Island. Um, and then she also has like Emily of New Moon. Um, just very like place-centered titles. And throughout those books, um, the characters tend to grow or have their identity kind of shift during those books, which then will lead into the next episode, obviously. Um, so I'm going to assuming that uh, Fishbane did that on purpose. But honestly, to me, it felt like the distinct parts really reflected who Maude was as a person in the different situations and different stages of her teenage years. Because um, she kind of started off in the first part, which is Maude of Ca Cavendish. And she's just an orphan who has to suffer at the hands of her small, narrow-minded town and her strict grandparents. Um, but then when she goes to Prince Albert, she's kind of like learning kind of like who she is. She's kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit, but she's having... She, what she thought she knew who she was she then realizes that kind of that's not who she was that's not why she was brought to Prince Albert um and then at the end in the last part it's Maud of the Island she's kind of more of a more self-assured young woman who's more certain of what she wants who she is um and is really just trying to figure out how to get there um versus just being like that little girl back in Cavendish who's like I want to be a writer. I want to be a teacher. Um, but not really having like a plan or a course of action to take. And I've always, I really just appreciated how Fishbane kind of tied those all together, but also tying them to her sense of place. Um, and, and so she, Maude kind of discovers that it's like, she's not just a, of Cavendish. She's not just a Prince Albert, those like small cities, but she's a, uh, Prince Edward Island is her home and it's who, in who she is and so then she kind of has like her feet on the ground and so she can go forward without having to s sacrifice who she was or who she is um, to combine her duty and her purpose. I love it. So deep. So deep. I, that is an amazing correlation that I totally didn't know. I've never read the Emily of New Moon books. I actually didn't know about those. And I think it was Anna. I think you might have been the one who told me about those books. So that's amazing. Um, okay, so number three, Ellen Montgomery was a great lover and master of the written word. Are there any passages or scenes that stood out to you as particularly moving or emblematic of the reading life and the writing life? So of course, you know, um, all of us here at Paper and Glam Book Club and the Sisterhood are, are also great lovers of the written word. And I just love that this entire book was just sprinkled with just like little gems about the reading and the writing life. So um, I love on page 31, where again, she's talking about reading a book with Nate. She said, to lend him her favorite book was almost too intimate. She had underlined moving passages. Perhaps it would reveal too much. And this is one of those things that, 
like, you know, when the book comes to you at like the perfect time, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but I'm going to, um, <laughs> don't make me regret it. <laughs> so I'm currently seeing a man who's an English teacher and we're reading a book together. And I definitely have this like moment where I'm like, oh, do I want to share that? That might like reveal too much. <laughs> and it's, it is very intimate sharing, uh, like reading a book with someone that like you're seeing romantically it like I don't know maybe because I find books just so incredibly personal you know I'm an only child so I always had this like really rich inner life I'm in you know I'm an old soul it just happened to be that like all the things that I thought were really cool that nobody else thought was cool kind of became cool because of the beautiful thing called the internet right just so <laughs> um seasonal living and book club and bible study and playing with stickers all are just like things that I've nerded out about that are almost like my like private things. And so, you know, I love sharing with them with you guys because you guys are all about the same things, but um, sharing them with other people does feel really intimate. You know, I'm sure you guys understand those of you that like plan with stickers and do a lot of these things. It's like, you know, people who aren't in that kind of world are like, what? Why is grown woman playing with stickers? You know? So um, anyway, I love also on page 33, which is just like the next page over, this is also such a great segue to um, the third question. While it was expected she would marry, the idea wasn't appealing. Maude wanted to see things, do things, and write about things. She wasn't sure how, but if Louisa May Elcott, who had fewer opportunities than she did, could do it, maybe, just maybe, Maude could write too. So one of the things I find so inspiring about Ellen Montgomery's life is that she chose to remain single until she was very, very successful. She had already released Anne of Green Gables. I mean, by the time she'd married at 37, I mean, there was like already, I think, a park in her hometown, like dedicated to the tourism traffic who came to see where Anne of Green Gables took place and came to see, you know, Prince Edward Island and that the setting for those books. So she was a very celebrated author, very, well, what we would consider very young, and just to choose, to choose so just deliberately um, not to marry. And, and, and we know from her journals that she, she chose that from a very young age. And, you know, as a 34 year old single woman, like the pressure to be married is like palpable. So I can only imagine, you know, more than a hundred years ago, the pressure that she had to have lived under while still choosing her love of writing in a time when she really couldn't do both. And um, I, it also really reminds me of like Coco Chanel's story, um, another like famous single woman who, you know, we're all wearing pants today because of Coco Chanel. <laughs> you know, we probably, we may still not be wearing pants if not for Coco Chanel. Uh, so I just think about women like this who have really paved the way for, for the lives that we have today uh, as women and the freedom that we have today as women. And um, yeah, just the boldness that she lived with was just really incredible. Um, I love on page 58 where she says, there was an ease in the silence of measured productive work. And that made me miss just like having a team a little bit because, you know, it's, there's something about just working alongside someone, even if you're not talking, you're just like sitting together and it's quiet and you're just like doing your work. It just feels really good. It also reminds me of in college when, you know, you're like studying in the library. We used to, it, University of San Diego where I went to school, there was a big library that literally looked straight out of Harry Potter and with the catwalks and everything. And I just remember like going in there, there was like this, like, there was like this hum of like productivity, but also like peace, just like being surrounded by all the books. And that line reminded me of that. Um, I love the line on page 60 that says, ignoring words was like ignoring the color of the sky on a summer's day, impossible. And on the next page is a beautiful seasonal description. It was one of those, autumn afternoons when the warmth of the sun teased a person into thinking winter would never come. And that's very emblematic of life in Napa. We have an Indian summer. It's hot all the way through October and it does feel like winter is never going to come. On page 66, there's like a beautiful seasonal uh, scene here. It says the Cavendish ladies had back baked up a spread of their finest treats and were serving fresh hot apple cider. The hall was decorated with fine white bunting and fall flowers. Um, I just highlighted so much, you guys, but since it's just me and Anna, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, the next page, page 68, Maude couldn't help but feel like she was on the precipice of something wonderful. You guys know that feeling? I feel like I'm in that season right now where 
finally after having like a very dark night of the soul I'm like coming out of it and <laughs> it just feels like I'm on the precipice of like beginning again and I just love that I just also love this time of year right it, like as Gatsby says or Scott Fitzgerald says in the great Gatsby life starts all over again in the fall you know I also love 69 there was something ghostly and gothic about being out at night I I still love that like even when I go out with friends it's like I go out at night and it just feels a little forbidden feels a little like oh I'm a kid out past my bedtime and then on page 76 this was really interesting what Melanie Fishbane did so um Maud Ella Montgomery wrote a book um or I guess it's a non-fiction book about her kind of success and and her I believe it was um like her gosh, how to describe this, because I, I meant to look this up a little deeper, but she wrote a, she wrote a um, series that was featured in, like, the Ladies Home Journal called The Alpine Path, and it was about her, like, steep journey up to success as a woman, and it's referenced in this poem that Maude is asked to read in school, and it's from this, well, it's from this poem that she's uh, asked to read in school called The Fren Fringe Gentian, and it says, the Alpine path, so hard, so steep, that leads to heights sublime. How I may reach that far off goal of true and honored fame and write upon its shining scroll, a woman's humble name. So that is a poem that in real life very much inspired Maud, so much so that she wrote um, about her journey based, you know, and, and, and titled it based on that poem. So I thought that was really clever of Melanie Fishbane to imagine and to uh, fit that in. And that was on page 76. And then um, to that end, on 79, she says, it would be a constant reminder of a fall off, far off goal. Perhaps one day, if she was vigilant, she would reach those sublime heights. So she had that, uh, the Alpine Path actually copied into her journal, and it talks about uh, that in the book. But that's, that's also true of, um, of Maud's actual journal. Almost everything in here is, is from the journals. So that's part of what makes this such a work of art. And I have more quotes on the on journals because I'm obsessed with journals, but we'll I'll save those. And I think I have said enough quotes for now. <laughs> there are never too many quotes. I know. Um, yeah. So I really focused on one particular scene. Um, not that long, so I'll just read it. Um, Mod, it's a, it starts on page 347 or chapter 8 of part 3. Yeah, part 3. Um, Maud was also in a flurry of creative activity, spending many evenings in her bedroom writing and studying. She was doing something that Pastor Felix called spade work, outlining stories and characters. Sometimes her characters emerged fully formed. Other times, she didn't know where they belonged. She had long abandoned the stories about dying queens and had turned to ones based on her own experiences. Um, so I, I love that one. That's like the first part of the scene um, because it reminds me of being in college. I took a lot of writing classes in college for short stories and novels, and it's just something I really enjoy doing. And also when I was a kid, my sister and I used to do these things called forum role plays. Um, basically, it's kind of like... Um, like popcorning a story. So you make your characters, um, you set the scene, and then you put your characters in together and see what happens, basically. Um, and we did that so much. We had Twilight-themed ones, we had um, Warrior Cat-themed ones, and then we just had like our own characters that we would just throw into some random world um, that we just created out of thin air. And we would just do that for hours. And like always being able to create characters and never always knowing exactly where they go. It's like, okay. Or having a character and having them be in like a very specific type of setting, but then taking them out of a setting and putting them somewhere completely new. Um, it just, this scene just reminds me of that so much. And being a casual writer versus being a like published author or anything, uh, it just speaks to my heart a little bit. Um, the next part was after From Prince Albert to P Island was published, things had become clearer for Maud. Upon rereading it, she recognized how pieces of her memory were woven into it. She'd been so focused on writing a good essay that she hadn't noticed how some of the descriptions, such as to kiss the dew from the grasses and coquette with the waters of the blue Saskatchewan, reminded her strongly of Will's kisses. 
The way she described the rhythm of the train as they passed the ripe Manitoban wheat fields and snug farmhouses. And the word snug reminded Maud of those nights cozying up with Laura on Laurel Hill. It had made her somewhat embarrassed. Writing a piece of nonfiction was one thing, but to display one's soul on the page for the world to see was something Maud had never considered. As a sort of test, she asked in her next letters to Will and Laura what they thought about the essay, but neither one spotted what she had unwittingly done. Um, so, I don't know, it's just, I totally relate to that because I actually am terrible at writing nonfiction. Um, I t my prose just tends to be a lot more flowery than it should be when writing nonfiction. Um, drove my essay teachers absolutely bonkers. Um, but also, half when you're writing fiction, you're you're really burying your soul, even if like it's you're writing a story about vampires in New Orleans, or if you're writing a high fantasy set somewhere completely different. Um, and so those just really speak to my heart. And I highlight, I marked a number of the other quotes that you did, Lisa Marie, just those seasonal words. And um, I, I'm really curious to actually see how many of the descriptions um, were actually direct quotes from the journals um, and how many of them are actually like Melanie Fishbane's own writing style. Um, I might need to see if I could find one of her other books to see if she keeps that style across the board. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, and I have lots to say about the journals in, I think it's question five. Um, so yeah, this is kind of fun having like an intimate little book chat, Anna. I, I like it. I love our book chatters and I miss them. I was telling Anna before we started recording that um, it's always my great fear that like since I started this book club and did I, did I talk about the Paper and Glam book club anniversary? I don't think I did yet. Well, Anna posted in our Facebook group and she texted me that Two days ago was the six year anniversary of the Paper and Glam Book Club, which is incredible. I've been doing this little book club uh, just in my free time out of the love of, of reading um, and just wanting to connect like-minded readers uh, for six years now, which is, which is incredible. And like back then I was like, why isn't there an online book club? Like, why isn't that a thing? And now of course that's a huge thing and there's a ton of them, but I just, I love that we're officially six years old. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I have a couple more bookish quotes while we're at it. Um, on 119, I loved, he kissed as though he was writing in the margins of a book with deep intensity. And then I laughed out loud right below. It says, uh, should she disturb her fragile joy with another disappointing letter? And that's like always me when I open up my inbox. I'm like, should I disturb my fragile joy by opening up my inbox? Because <laughs> you just never know what's going to be in there. And then um, I love the quote on 129. Um, I have a problem with overthinking. You might be able to relate to that. I am this year really learning to just like, be okay with making mistakes and be, you know, and not sacrificing my health and my sanity for the illusion of professionalism or um, just like feeling like I have, there's a bunch of new things I'm going to start trying with paper and glam. And I, I don't know exactly how it's all going to work. And I'm okay with that for the first time, you know, normally it's like, right, like book club, like we just talked about, I decide to do something and I do it forever, you know, right? Like I have subscriptions, I sub sticker subscriptions, we did a whole new brand new collection every month for five years, right? Like I choose, I choose to do something, plan out how we're going to do it and then we do it forever. So I am really embracing this Tony Robbins idea of like, if you're in your head, you're dead. You know, like my mom always says, just do something, even if it's wrong, be always overthinking. So I really related to this quote on 129 that Maude said, um, I just have so much to think about. And Nate says, I suspect that's much of your predicament, thinking too much. And Maude says, why do you think I write so much? My thoughts need to go somewhere. There was truth in this. Whenever things did get too much, too emotional, she would write in her journal. And that is what I do. I have a saying, and if you've been God and Glam, you've heard me say this, but take it to the journal. I always say like, don't take it to the internet. Don't take it out on your, like, what are your relationships? Like, take it to the journal. And it's easier said than done. But uh, I thought that that was just really relatable. All right, um, anything else to add, Anna, before we move on to number four? Okay, cool. So number four, 
This is a quote that I took from the back of the book, um, the author's note, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend you read the author's note. Anytime you're reading historical fiction, there's almost always an author's note. And it's almost always something that in my humble opinion, you should read first because I, I always read it first because it just has so much, um, it just like really helps me understand the author's intent and understand kind of the times so uh, this quote says, I was trying to find the page number um, of where I took this from. All right, on one, uh, excuse me, on 373. This novel takes place while Maud is just discovering what it means to be a writer and a woman during a period where women's education, let alone being a writer, was considered inappropriate. Maud's passion, ambition, and dream for education set her apart. She didn't have the luxury that many women in the Western world have today of being allowed to choose between ambition and career or love and marriage or all of the above. Maud essentially would eventually would marry in 1911 at the age of 1937. Or excuse me, I, sorry, the age of 37. And she had three sons. Um, so it's really like fascinating. Um, like something I get asked is like, oh, are you gonna have kids on your own? And it's like, no, but Maud, like, I just love that she was like, I'm getting married at 37 and I'm still gonna have three kids and I'm, and I'm gonna be a celebrated author and I'm gonna do everything. And she just wasn't, um, I mean, I, I'm sure she was scared and felt the pressure, but like, it didn't let her, it didn't sway her at all. And it felt like a lot of this book the through line like we talked about earlier was just all of the just societal like rules that were put on women um, to almost contain them. There was one one passage about how when Maud got to be, when she traveled to Prince Edward Island, she now had to like dress like a woman. And so she had to get up 30 minutes earlier just to put on like corset and like all the different layers that they had to wear out. I just can't imagine just being so encumbered by clothing and being so encumbered by just the, the very, very rigid place of a woman in that time. So the question is, what do you think it means to be a woman and a professional? What insights about that balance have you discovered? So this is something that I have really been working out more than ever this summer. The quote that I've been repeating to myself, which comes from my business coach, which is ruthless self-care will lead to your destiny. And I am really learning how to be a person and not just a brand. Um, if you're new and you're new to my story, I have, you know, from the time I was 16, I worked full time and went to school full time. And then I worked full time and did, then when I graduated from college, I worked full time and then worked nights and weekends doing retail to pay down my student loans. And then as soon as I had my student loan paid for, I went really hard. I worked full time, then went really hard on paper and glam. And then, um, Paper and Glam was at a point in 2016 where I quit my job and then did Paper and Glam like 80 hours a week. So I have always been like a professional and, and haven't always, like I've, I've been a professional first. So this idea of what it means to like really step into my femininity and um, be, a, be a woman first is just really fascinating to me. If you're in the God and Glam community, um, if you're a God and Glam patron, then you um, have access to a talk I did for the last God and Glam patron um, live stream on the Divine Feminine, which is a lot about this and uh, like what it means to embody the Divine Feminine and how we as women are socialized and rewarded for Im for um, embodying the divine masculine, which is, creates a lot of tension in our spirits and in our bodies and creates a lot of sickness because we're women, we're not, we're not meant to live by masculine paradigms. And, um, so yeah, this is just something that is really, really near and dear to my heart and something that, um, I really, you know, I, I really don't like the word balance because I don't think it exists. I think there's just all choices. And even when we do have balance, it's usually because like, you know, you get three balls in the air, three fall down, and then you go pick up the other three and throw them in the air again while the other three fall down. You know, I have let go of the illusion of, of like doing it all at once um, because it was killing me literally. Um, and so, yeah, like I think we're still figuring out what it means to be a woman in prof and a professional. And Maude was like among the first women to really do this, right? Like same with like, um, well, maybe not among the first women to really do this, but the first 
like women that we like have these incredible records of and just you know of course like women like Deborah in the Bible right that goes back to Genesis we know that there was tons of entrepreneurs and there's there's women in the New Testament too 100 percent but um we're still figuring out what that looks like in 2020 and we're also going through a huge paradigm change you know I really think COVID is changing the game as far as like how we approach the thing that you know is kind of almost like pejoratively at this point called work-life balance right like everything is changing with what it looks like uh to work and um yeah many many thoughts on that that was a kind of a big ramble Anna <laughs> what did you think no I'm totally with you um at first I really had a hard time with this question um just kind of thinking about it because I I grew up in the south so there, even in my small town, like there was still kind of that standard of if you're a woman, you act like a woman. If you're a man, you act like a man. Um, and while, while I was in high school, that was getting a lot more blurred. And then of course, um, when I moved out to the West Coast, it's a lot, it's a lot more blurred um, in university in, um, and especially in like my career, um, even though I do work in a female dominated field it's definitely still a thing and so I really had a hard time with this because my brain automatically knows like okay you have strengths that only a woman has um and so you can't like confine yourself to the masculine paradigm but you kind of have to because that's the kind of corporate world that we live in now um and then in the last few years since I've been living in Denver I've had like a really big um, shift in my face as well and kind of really like settling into um, the woman God is calling me to be and figuring out what that looks like. So I really enjoyed the uh, God and Lamb Patreon chat of the Divine Feminine even though I missed it live. Um, so if our viewers haven't seen it yet they really need to go watch that because that was fantastic. Um, but even today like we hold women to a standard that they have to choose between their family and their career. They have to have work-life balance. But back in Maud's day, there was no work-life balance. You worked together with your family. You played together with your family. Like everything was integrated. And we make such a big stink about everything is separate. Um, back when we started moving into corporate world, instead of focusing on um, like the farmlands, because uh, back in the day, America was mostly like farms, but then we moved into factories and uh, then industry just took over. And so that's when that whole work-life balance kind of had to come to, a, come to a head. And now you're just kind of, if you're a woman and you choose your, to have focus on your family, you're screwed because you're going to get judged for choosing your family over having a career. And then you're accused of um, putting all the weight on like your husband or your partner of doing um, all of just being a stay at home uh, wife or mom. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like that is work. But then there's also, if you're, if you choose a to have a career and focus on that, then you're judged because it's like, well, what if, why aren't you getting married? Why aren't you having kids? Um, how could you <laughs> just that kind of whole thing? And if you try to have both and it's like, and you have like your career, but then you're also at home, but during the day, your kids are like staying with, um, like either they're staying with their dad or they have a babysitter or they're in daycare. They're like, how could you let a stranger like care for your, care for your children all the time? And like, it's just basically a damned if I do, damned if I don't approach. And I hate it so much. Um, and so because of that, Mott's struggle to me just wasn't really new. Um, I say as I overuse air quotes, like always. Um, but today, I do, will, I do really appreciate the fact that we do, as a society, um, and as a human race, really, we do pride ourselves in educating both men and women. And even though it's not always as encouraged as it could be, we do as a society have that societal dream that anyone can be anything they want to be man, woman, um, I mean, dogs can be, uh, Instagram models now, like, that's insane to me, like, even though they probably don't really care, they just want treats, 
and love. Um, but they, anyone can be what they want to be. And we have that as a base societal desire. And I really appreciate the fact that we do still encourage that. Um, and we still have a long way to go before it's like perfect and work-life integration is back. Um, maybe not so much as it was back in the, back in mods day, but definitely, definitely we're shifting towards that. And I do really want to see how my fingers are crossed that it just goes well. I know there's going to be some hiccups over, over time and, but COVID-19 especially has proven that it can be done. And in a lot of cases it should be done. Yeah. We talked about this a lot in the Divine Feminine talk for God and Glam, but just like a quick kind of spoiler alert, and I'd love for you to go watch it, but we talked about how, and this is also a lot of the big inspiration for all things paper and glam, we talked about how we were an agricultural society, right, like a hundred years ago before the Industrial Revolution, so that meant that men were in the home and women were in the home, and also it embedded seasonal rhythms into the year. So part of my heart for papering lamb in that everything is based on seasonal living, right? We read seasonally, we plan seasonally, and we read the Bible seasonally. And that is to install those seasonal rhythms that we were meant to live by, right? We have seasons for a reason. God created the world with seasons for a reason because they are to govern how we live in each season. And that was so deeply embedded in our worldview and created just beautiful communal spirit and family spirit that we have really lost as we've gotten to be more like knowledge workers as, as, the, as it's termed. So now it's really interesting because um, I read a great book and this is in the talk, the Divine Feminine talk too, called The Tender Warrior that talks about how much damage has been done by men being taken out of the home, right? Because right about the industrial revolution women started staying home with kids and men went to like the factories right they, they that's when they started going to work predominantly and not having that masculine um influence in the home started to damage the like the growth of children and led to um you know relational issues and stuff like that so it is really interesting seeing kind of how COVID could potentially sooner rather than later bring parents back into the home in the way that they were uh, before the industrial revolution, which is like Anna, like you said, which is really like how we were intended to live. Like my great grandmother had 13 children and like they did everything together. Like Anna said, they worked together, they played together, they ate together. That was their friends. That was, that was, like everything, like the family was everything. And we've gotten, we've really gotten away from that. So it's going to be really interesting just to see um, as we're moving into a more feminine paradigm and, you know, the feminine paradigm, not to get too far off topic, because this is all in the other talk, but, you know, feminine paradigm is like everything's all together, right? And the masculine paradigm is that compartmentalized paradigm right and I'm sure you see that in your husbands or your boyfriends or like any man you know like they really compartmentalize in a way that we don't for us like everything is all together so we're shifting into back into a more feminine paradigm and I'm just really excited um, about that especially since everything we do here at Paper and Glam is really um, at the end of the day about the communication of traditional feminine values of, of home um, all right, number five. Uh, the inspiration for this book club selection was an episode of What Should I Read Next? It was episode 14, and that's a podcast by Ann Bogle. And the guest, one of her favorite books was the selected Journals of Ellen Montgomery. And this is a five volume set that is all of her journals. There's some parts have been, excuse me, have been taken out. And I had no idea that this was even a thing. And the reason this was so inspiring to me is it's something that I think a lot about is I have been keeping both paper and digital journals since about 2008. And I always joke with my friends, like, if anything happens to me, go burn the journals. Uh, go burn them. Do not let anyone find the journals. <laughs> And um, I love that Maud had the same thought, and this is on page um, 369 in the section about Maud, uh, more about Maud and her times. 
It says, as she got older, Maud was focused on how her readers might think about her. So she created an image of a good minister's wife and mother who was somehow able to balance family and a prolific and prosperous writing career. Sound familiar, right? Like how many of us, myself, I'll speak for myself, like I feel like this is so relatable. I've spent like a lifetime, like kind of pretending that I could do it all. And finally, you know, in April, it just got too heavy and I let it all go and like let the bridges I burn light the way. And the fact that she is, was thinking about this and like wanting to kind of be the quote unquote like Pinterest wife at this time while also portraying that she like had this beautiful home life, but also this incredible writing career. And we know that she was deeply unhappy in her marriage. Um, and ultimately uh, her husband really st struggles from the, the mental illness. And then Ella Montgomery, she turned in her very last manuscript, The Blies Were Quoted, and then um, committed suicide. So um, she thought so much about legacy. And so it goes on to say, when she was in her 40s, Mad sat, Mad sat down and decided to copy out her old journals into new uniform ledgers, destroying the originals. These 10 volumes can be found in Glef and contain pictures that she took of her home, places she traveled, and the people she loved. So it's basically a blog, right? <laughs> like in her journals. And while Maud said that she copied her journals word for word, there are sections that are so heavily edited, such as the mock trial scene that appears in this novel. They read like fiction. Also, some entries were sliced out and then new ones like Nate's love letter were inserted. Maud's journal, normally a private document, was edited and revised into a version of her life she wished for us to see. And I have this great aspiration that one day I'm going to like edit all my journals and, like into, into a book because I just think that'd be so fascinating. And um, there's so many great quotes about journals in here that I really related to. Um, like on page 142, she said, she still thought of the old journal, the one she had burned not even a year before. So much had changed since then. It was probably just as well that she had burned it. It was as if it had been written by some other girl. And I don't know if you've ever gone back and read journal entries that you read like, that you wrote like three months ago. I mean, for me, I read stuff I wrote at the beginning of the summer and I'm like, I've already lost touch with that person. Wow, you know, just the growth that you see from reading those journals. And then I also love this quote about the journals on 97. It was weird and wonderful to relive things that had only just happened, as though her journal had a story and life of its own. She remembered experiencing the events, but reading about them, even a few weeks later, it made it feel as though they had happened so long ago, as though she were talking about a different person. And again, that's that same thing, because, you know, when I, when I write things out in my journals, it's like, I'm in a certain emotional state, right? And then when I go back and read it, like, those emotions are, are like no longer relevant in the same way. So it totally feels like, like a lifetime ago. And I, I love that about, about writing a journal and keeping a journal because like, you can't recreate that, right? You can't recreate those emotional states. And, but if I read my journal, it's like, I remember exactly what I felt like at that time. I remember, I can remember like the books that were on the nightstand and like the candle I was burning, which right now is the sexy librarian candle from uh, Frostbeard Studio. Um, and I just love, I just love like almost like the time capsulation of life. And you guys know I wake up in the morning for the art and science of living. So um, journals are just something I think so much about. So uh, the question here is, do you, did you find Ellen Montgomery's record of her life inspiring? Do you keep a journal or record your days? Oh, take it away, Miss Anna. So I love the fact that Ellen Montgomery not only kept journals for pretty much her entire life, but also the fact that she made the time and took the effort to go back and just edit out her journals and was thinking about legacy, as you were saying. Um, I personally don't keep a journal. Um, I love the idea and I dabble in it on and off, but I am very much type one and I have a really hard time dealing with my own emotions, <laughs> in all honesty. Um, and so, like, if I go back and read them or just having to, like, sit with them and then, like, I don't like these feelings. These are not, like, the, the good feelings. Like, it's not that the feelings are good or evil, but, like, that's how my brain kind of categorizes them. It's like, I don't like this and this doesn't seem right. So, I tend to either, if it's a digital journal, I will just delete it or just pretend it doesn't exist. So... <laughs> Um, but 
I, I do really want to keep the habit because I think it would be a really, again, with a whole legacy, like even if I just kept track of something, um, my husband and I actually right now we're in the fifth month of our pregnancy and we've actually been keeping a journal that we're writing to our baby. Um, and so we're slowly but surely, um, we don't do it every night. Uh, we started off, but with life, like it's so crazy, especially with COVID, uh, going on right now. Um, but we still try to like, just write little letters and, you know, tell our baby what was going on while they were in the womb and just let them know that we love them. And so I, I love that habit that we have. Um, but even just like going, being able to go through and like, know that if something happens to me, like our kids and our grandkids would have that, like that record of our lives and like know what it was like. Like, I mean, sure, they may sit, end up sitting in a dusty old attic somewhere one day, but I won't be here to see it. So, <laughs> um, so it's definitely a habit I want to pick up, but I have a really hard time just being able to sit with it and accept the fact that life is messy, emotions are messy, and that's okay. And I'm learning that a lot this year. So, hi, uh, you're a one on the Enneagram. Is that what you meant when you said type one? Yeah, I resonate with that so much. As a four, you know, I spin my emotions into gold. That's what makes me, uh, you know, uh, an artist. And um, it's interesting because it's like I, you know, fours go to one at rest. And so it's like, when I am like at my best, I am not all that emotional, but I'm also not all that creative. So it's really, it's really fascinating um, to see that. And then when I'm, when I'm at, in my nice four place, my good four place, I am both like emotional, but also uh, like emotionally disciplined and um, can use my emotions to create really, really beautiful things. Um, uh, but yeah, but the weight of the world, I definitely feel really deeply and it makes me very empathic and, um, you know, what we would call a HSP, highly sensitive person. So I have learned from a young age that like, no one can kind of contain my emotions, but the Lord. So I've been journaling for just like my whole life. Um, so I, from 2008 to 2016, I kept paper journals and they're all like in my bookshelves. And then um, in 2016, I discovered an app called Day One. And I really liked it because it helped me to um, be able to record like digital things easier. So like I'll, I'll screenshot text conversations, um, that I want to save and put in my journal or, you know, like little memes or like little encouraging things that like Anna has sent me or like members of the paper and glam community have sent me or whatever, something I saw on Pinterest pictures, like it's just really easy to just throw those in. And so I got out of the habit of paper journals, but it's really funny. Like this book came to me right at, like the right time and I'm kind of coming home to myself, you know, it kind of what feels like divine time being because I actually switched back after years, right? Like four years, like the entire time I've basically been running paper and glam full time, I have done digital and I just switched back to paper journals and like I'm going back and finishing my journal from 2015. Um, and on the cover it says with freedom, the moon and books who could not be happy, which is a wall of what? Oscar Wilde quote. And that's something that I think about all the time. I also have a vase. It's a Kate Spade vase that says that because it's like in these times, it's like, I'm healthy. I sleep indoors. Like I have the moon. I have flowers in my books. Like I am going to choose to be happy. Right. It's like that Henry Nowen quote, choose joy and keep choosing it. Um, so yeah, it's been really, really like romantic to go back to keeping a handwritten journal and there's just something about the sensation of physically writing for me. So yeah, the journals are just like endlessly inspiring. And just the fact that Maude went back and redacted them, I just think that would be an incredible project. All right. Um, Anna, I am curious though, like how are you writing your journal to your baby? Like, are you guys writing it together? Like, how, do you write it together at night? How does that work? So we have, we actually found this journal at the thrift store. Um, it's just like a little map and then it has a Bible verse, a Joshua 1, 9 on it. And so we started, my, my husband started it actually. This is actually entirely his idea and I love it so much. Um, so he'll usually write an entry and then I'll usually write an entry on like the back page and like we'll switch off. Um, there are days where he'll write more or there are days where I write more. Um, like I actually have a couple entries in my phone that I need to transfer over and 
thankfully I realized that he left me some space to do that. So I need to actually go back in and add those to it. Um, whether I write them handwritten or if I print them out and just paste them in. Um, and yeah, we normally we do it at night right before bed, um, right before bed and prayers, but yeah, COVID has thrown our routines completely off every, every five seconds. So that's definitely been a party, but it's, it's something that whenever we're kind of feeling at our worst, we kind of come back to. And so I really, I really like that. And it's, it's helped us come together, but also, um, prepare to be a family of three. So. I love that. I love what you said. Like it's something you do when you're at your worst. I would have expected that as a type one, I would have expected that to be something you do at your best, but I like journaling is something that I do like at my work. Well, the struggle is very real. Trust me. <laughs> we actually get into like goofy little arguments where he's just like, you need to write to baby. Like here it is. You're not, he's like, I'm not letting you turn off your light until you <laughs> write something. Um, and it's the cutest thing. Um, but yeah, if, if I'm not feeling my best, I definitely do struggle with wanting to write, but I know I always feel better afterwards. So yeah. I always feel better after too. It's like a spiritual glass of wine. I'm just like, oh, I'm so calm. Um, is your husband's name's John, right? Okay, that's what I thought. Um, is he a writer in the same way that you are? Not exactly. Um, he's actually a sports writer in his free time. Um, he's been. He's also a. He's been on sports radio as well. Um, he runs a couple sports blogs right now. Um, that are mostly just hobbies at the moment, but to turn into more kind of like side hustle things but he does write a lot and love it all right so the last question is do you have any recommendations for Ella Montgomery fans who want to know more about her life and times so of course I would so recommend the five volume journals of Ella Montgomery they're really pretty like pastel colors and then Anna you were going to recommend a book that was on what should I read next is on my TBR and has the most beautiful cover yeah, so my number one recommendation actually technically isn't about Ella Montgomery, but it's about Marilla from Anna Green Gables, um, and it's basically about her teenage years. Um, it's by Sarah McCoy, and so basically it's what half, what was going on in Green Gables before Anne came to town, like what's uh, Marilla's story, what's Matthew's story, um, and I haven't read it yet. It's actually like on my list to pick up after we finish this because I need to know. I need to read this. And the cover is absolutely gorgeous. There's these beautiful paper and glam pink flowers and a like little white cottage. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, there's a couple other recommendations that I forgot to put in the regular notes. So I'll add them later. Um, and with the Neo Netflix, obviously, if you're an Anne Green Gables fan, I love that adaptation. Um, I think there's only three seasons, unfortunately, which makes me really sad, but they have all been fantastic so far. And then if you want to read or listen to Anna Green Gables, Mary-Kate Wiles, who performed as Kitty Bennett in, um, not Kitty Bennett, Lydia Bennett in the, um, Lizzie Bennett Diaries web series on YouTube uh, back in like 2012 to 2014, I think, is actually performing um, in Anna Green Gables um, on Apple Podcast. Um, she releases them first to her Patreons, but then the week after they come out for everybody else. And those have been really fantastic to get to listen to and kind of revisit after reading this. Yeah, and then lastly, we as a book club read Anna Green Gables in October of 2017. So it's kind of the perfect book for fall because it has so many beautiful just seasonal descriptions. Actually, it might have been October 2017. Um, so yeah, that is there for you too if you want to go back and read it. Rachel McAdams has a beautiful version on Audible that I listened to when we read it back then. And um, speaking of paper and glam pink flowers, I loved this. I chose this book because A, it's the perfect colors. There are paper and glam colors for August, uh, which is this paper and glam pink and black. And then also it's just like, you know, we're all excited for fall. And I have to say, 
I am actually, I understand like wanting to fall, fall to happen already. It was always hard for me to understand that because I spent like my whole summer designing the fall collection. But since that wasn't on my agenda this year, it's like now I'm, I, I feel like I'm with you guys this year and I'm like, okay, let's do fall already. So I also wanted to show you guys lastly, this bookmark that my mom had made for me. It just matched perfectly with this book and I'd never seen a bookmark like this, but it was so sweet. I love gold and it's like a little, it's like a little um, hook that you hook into the spine of your book. I, when I first got it, I was like, I don't understand. How does this work? Because I was trying to put it like on my book like that, but it actually just hooks into the spine and I have just had so much fun like reading my book and having like book jewelry. And then, so it has pink little stones on it or beads rather. And then it has a cross at the bottom. And I just thought it was very paper and glam. It would be fun to put in a Bible as well. So I thought you guys would enjoy that little like book jewelry because I've, yeah, like I said, never seen anything like that. And I just love the way it looks on my nightstand, just like folded up um, with like, just this little like beautiful bookmark hanging out. All right, so housekeeping to close us out. So next month we are reading this beautiful fall covered book. Look at this gorgeous fall leaf. This is called Harry's Trees and it is by John Cohen. If you want to kind of meet the author in advance, he was on What Should I Read Next? I believe twice talking about this book, talking about his writing, talking about um, his reading life. So that's fun. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to go back to some, well, we were reading fiction, but it felt like nonfiction. And so this is going to be just hopefully the perfect bridge into fall for us. Um, the dates of our next book club live stream, which is always the last Thursday of the month, and our Patreon live stream, which is always the Thursday before, are down below. And then we have a really exciting Patreon live stream this month. We're going to be picking the 2021 titles together. So it's really important to me as we go into this new era of paper and glam that we're all co-creators of this beautiful community and beautiful life together. So I, instead of me just picking with the book chatters, I want to pick with all of you. Um, so that is on Patreon. I would love for you guys to support the reading life that we have together. And um, if you have a title that you would like to be on the 2021 um, book list, bring it to us. We're going to actually vote on, on the titles together in real time. So um, don't miss next month. If you are a patron and you had an ARC that you, we, we gave away um, advanced review copies of books that haven't been published yet, thanks to D, those all have been mailed. The book club live stream, excuse me, the patron live stream from last month is up live for you too. If you missed that, it was really, really fun. Um, we had like Priya gave us a tour of her huge planner collection, which is incredible. Um, Keely walked us through her reading journal, which was really beautiful. Um, yeah, we had a lot of fun last patron live stream. And then we gave away a bunch of ARCs, which is A, my opportunity to tell you guys with D, our bookseller, about new releases that are coming out and also give them away to you. So um, with that, I think that's all the bookish news you can use for this beautiful August evening. I hope you guys have a wonderful month in the reading life, and I will see you same time, same place, September, in September, and thank you for reading a book a month with us.